I just paid well, a guy on Fiverr 35 euros to make us an intro, like an animated uh, thing. Oh, very cool. So let's see how that turns out. You never know. Hey, if that turns out well, then I might tap the same dude for my stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause... Like, Fiverr is genius. Yeah, for that price, that's that's freaking amazing. Yeah, like, it, it turns out most of the world uh, are paid less than us. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess that's a good price for them, or they're really fast and good at their jobs, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, when you do hundreds, if not thousands of little projects like that, I'm yeah. sure it's like, like, All oh yeah, sure, this is what you want? I'm, I'm sure you'll like this. Yeah. And for the price, you're not gonna, you're not gonna squawk. Or if you do, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. That's the weird. That's the weird thing about those back and forths. Yeah. You know, that's that's one of the things that like gets me a little skeevy about taking on like a low budget or no budget right. uh, film. Sometimes it's like, it's almost like there's a line that I want to draw where it's like, okay. At this price point or below, here's my catalog. Use whatever you want <laughs> yeah. and just give me attribution, yeah. you know? Yeah. But at this price point or above, I'll play the back and forth game. But that's going to be limited, too, because, exactly. I mean, how many edits are right. fair? Right. You know, yeah. like, what have you experienced with that? Like, uh, like what kind of what uh, kind of pushback have you gotten from stuff like that or. Or whatever, so you know? Like in nine out of ten cases or or uh, projects I do for people, they're happy with the first draft. Yeah. Um. If they're not happy with the first draft, I try to convince them why why they should be happy with the first draft. <laughs> and usually that right. goes well. And in a very small percentage of cases, they're like kind of hard to deal with. Um. But I, I don't think I've experienced that ever. Okay. Do you? What do you attribute that to? Like, how do you? How do you hit the mark ninety percent of the time? What? What? What prep work do you do that makes that happen? Uh, I ask f for if they can name a song in my catalog that they like. Mm -hmm. So I use the same instrumentation, uh, maybe the same key. I just make it very similar to what they already like, but they want something okay. unique. So I mean. It, it turns out different, but it's inspired by myself, kind of. Okay, so you're you're already you're already kind of in a win because they they're already telling you what they want, yeah, and then showing you an example that's not somebody else that you're ripping off, right? Right. <laughs> so sometimes Which... they do that as well, like link me a very famous piece by Bach or whatever that they want yeah. that stuff to sound like. Um, if I feel like it's something I'm going to struggle to accomplish, I usually deny the whole thing. Okay. Like, yeah, I just tell them that I don't have time right now. Let's go through my catalog. I'm sure you will find something that you can use. Uh, but um, no, I mean, people, when people reach out to you to uh, and wanting you to make music, they already like your style. So, I mean, they're already willing to pay you to do it. Right. So right. You, you just have to dig out the yourself from a hole and <laughs> here I am again. I have to do something in my own style. So I guess people are usually happy with that, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I, I've had my share of people looking for something and then, you know, they'll put in temp music and it could be anything. It could be something super famous or it could just be some I, I I say no name, but like somebody I've never heard of before, or some some stock stock audio or stock stock music, and occasionally with those people, like they ultimately just want that song. Yeah, you know they, they in so many words they're asking you to do something, but then every edit you give them is basically them coming back to well, I kind of just want that. Yeah, and yeah. I've gotten to the point where I actually will just say to somebody, look. If you like this, figure out how you can license it yeah. or figure out if you can use it with attribution. Like, forget me. You know what I mean? Like, you found the thing that does the thing for you. Like, who am I to tell you? <laughs> right. You know? Like, yeah. so, uh, you know, it, I think it's a little humbling because I think early on when you're writing music and you're trying to get into things and you're trying to get a book of 
experience and everything. Yeah. You want to try and do everything. You're going to say yes to right? everything. Yeah. yeah. And then ultimately, you, you know that um, on some levels, you're going to run into that, right? You're going to run into this weird thing where you're wasting some time or whatever. Yeah. Now it's like, I just absolutely like, I'll just do the, the best thing for the person or the client. And if yeah. that means me not doing it at all, that's fine too. Yeah, you know? it happens. Yeah. And sometimes yeah, just... that's like the kindest thing you can do to them. Just yeah. like, go do your thing. This yeah, here, I'm going to hold your hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, they reached well, out to you for some reason. Usually right. they have heard your music somewhere and they kind of like it. So they want to like have your your corruption <laughs> <laughs> on right, that right. song. But I think I think people are generally not really how to put this they don't really care like exactly what it sounds like as as long as they're they feel like we have done something for them. Okay. Yeah. Because, I see what you're I saying. Mean, the catalog is big enough. You could find all the things you want in the existing catalog and you would save money. Yeah. So the reason why they reach out to you is kind of like they, they want they want something from you. You know what I mean? Yeah, something unique. Yeah, something unique. Like I want you to put your unique imprint yeah. on this project. Yeah. Like oh yeah, all this other stuff you do is great. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> But I want you to do something for me, yeah. or at least the thing that you do for me. Yeah, it's the first time anybody's ever heard it. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's I oh. I feel like most people reaching out to me to do custom things are either on my Patreon list or have been licensing music from my from my website for a long time. Okay. So it's very few people that are googling like custom composition and then my name pops up. I, none of right. this. That never happens. You already have an established yeah, relationship. Yeah. So yeah. it's like usually it's people that have been licensing my music for free for years and now suddenly they have a project where they actually have a budget. Yeah. And they want something from me for that. That's pretty cool because that means that you've built you've built this rapport over time mm -hmm. by by giving it away under creative commons and yeah. royalty free with attribution and then down the road they're like hey, you know what i love alex's stuff and now i can afford to yeah. you know pay him yeah. something so he's the first person i'm going to attack right. you know is with this with this project yeah. you know and it's like now, it's really cool as well seeing these names over and over like year after year, you see these names and suddenly they kind of made it, you know? They made yeah. something good that people like and they're now actually making good money on it. Yeah. Like they started out using your free music, making like a very like bad indie game. And then like, it's like watching your children grow. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> well, now I know... Um, um, same, same, but different. We've already established this, but for my audience on Tim Kulik Free Music Podcast, um, just for the sake of uh, drawing a line in the sand, let's do introductions. Who is Alex Nakarada? Ooh. You know? I almost forgot. <laughs> uh, Norwegian royalty free music composer. Um, I'm currently in the in the race with Tim for the biggest catalog. Nice. I think he is probably going to go past me sometime really soon. Well, I don't know about that, but... <laughs> Aren't you... Didn't you pass 550? No, no, no. You did. Um, I did. <laughs> I'm at 502. 502. But, um, but I've got a very aggressive three-year schedule oh, ahead of me God. that I'll share yeah, with you. You're definitely going to go past me. <laughs> um, I've had my music placed in everything it feels like especially now that i have some data on it um but when did you get your start like when did you really start putting things out on the internet i think i was about 16 so okay 15 years ago okay that's when i started like 
recording bad covers, Metallica covers on my guitar and releasing them on YouTube. Nice. Uh, and then after a few years, maybe 17, I got my first external sound card, like the Zoom H4N. You know that one? Like the uh, yes. journalist. I never had one. one. And like used the built in effects and everything. And a couple of years later, I discovered MIDI. So mm -hmm. the guitar got back on the wall and I bought myself a electric piano with a MIDI input. Nice. And started experimenting with all these samples and all the fun stuff. What what was your first DAW? What what did you use? Cubase for your... Elements Five, I think. Okay. So yeah, good times. <laughs> it came with the came with the Zoom. <laughs> oh, very nice. Oh yeah, so it came. Yeah, it was a software hardware combo package oh, kind yeah. of thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was the Elements version, which which is like the cheapest version with very limited features. Was that like a only so many tracks of yeah, audio or MIDI information? Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Because Pro Tools had a free version for the longest time mm. where you could run, I think, a total of eight tracks. Yeah. I think maybe it was and, the same. And that's great for somebody that's recording from home, you know, that yeah. has not very complicated mixes like, you know and even if they did you could always you could always do multiple versions of a project mix down to a stereo track and then have one track and then free up the other ones again yeah you know what i mean yeah um so but that also requires it, that requires you to have a little more sophistication when it comes to mixing you're not able to you know? do that yeah. when you're starting yeah. out <laughs> no <laughs> you no. do not know that <laughs> so i <laughs> i mean i was probably lucky if i had three tracks in a song yeah i was like huge like i didn't know quantizing i didn't know like different file formats uh nothing so it was just like a rubble of chaos and badness do you use that function a lot do you do you quantize a lot of your tracks oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my like that's the first key i bind to like a easily accessible key on my keyboard yeah <laughs> like i do not want stuff to sound like natural <laughs> yeah like too much stuff yeah. happening for that i find i find myself gravitating towards that too there's it's very rare that i'll take a take without doing any adjustments to it just because whenever you pull in uh, like a MIDI drum loop or anything that's very fixed, like a uh, a patch with an L envelope in it mm -hmm. that has very distinct cutoffs. Yeah. Anytime that those hits are just slightly off, it's a complete like the end user probably will never notice it. No, but in the studio, I'm gonna notice it. Or when I'm doing a review, like a, a semi finished review mm -hmm. on a run or in my car driving someplace. I'll just be listening to it and I'll literally like, I don't know. I'll have this like Tourette's yeah, tick yeah, it gets where I'm like, like, OCD, I'm like, like Fuck. something is wrong. Like, I must fix that. And I think so that's especially important for us as well. That we're making music for visual content usually. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're listening to your favorite band on a, uh, on Spotify, it, it sounds natural in a way, but once you put the audio to video, the audio can't be doing that. The audio right. has to be clean, so it doesn't like steal too much attention from the from the thing you're scoring. Right, right. That's, and that's my excuses, at least. Yeah, mine too. Mine too. And I'm not the perfect player, you know. My uh, my uh, history in, of you know formal training is very limited. Mm -hmm. For like a two year period, maybe three, I had like traditional lessons yeah and that just basically taught me how to read sheet music right like i really exploded when i started doing ear training and learning things from a cd yeah. in, in a high school rock band yeah. you know um what's your background like what like like as far as the formal training nothing i did i had piano lessons for like two weeks when i was a kid okay uh, this is well before you started to do stuff in, in your teens? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Like, I, I basically had no musical training whatsoever. I just experimented 
I while everyone else was at a party or playing games or whatever, I was just sitting in my studio, little shitty studio setup, and playing with the DAW. That's awesome. So yeah, that's but awesome. I, I mean, I have been blessed with a good ear for music. That's that's yeah. I guess that's why what brought me here. I that's have great. No theoretical learning whatsoever i cannot read sheet music that's like, mm -hmm. that's, that's a different language yeah so yeah, yeah. It, so it's a lot of air air training yeah no tablature either like you never went the tab route or um i i mean traditional language or traditional sheet music rather is is for me very similar at this point i've been so far away from it for so long mm -hmm. that i would have to sit there it's kind of like a foreign language, like like saying it out loud, yeah. um, or or listening to it more than saying it out loud. I I can speak Spanish decently enough for a Spanish speaking person to hear understand me. Yeah. But then when they speak it back to me, I am so busy uh, interpreting and <laughs> interpreting dialect that it slows down to like a tenth of what I can say to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same thing goes with reading a piece of sheet music. I have to sit there and think, okay, that's a rest, blah, blah, blah. This is what it's going right. to sound like. Whereas if I just think it in my head, oh, I could just, I can just perform that. Like, right. you know, yeah. like it, that's just natural to me, you know? I used but, to read tablature for guitars. Okay. But, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd rather learn the solo by ear and play it a bit shittier than the original mm -hmm. than spending hours and hours like analyzing tablature yeah like I, i've always been like the biggest endorphin rush i can get is like doing something on my own yeah that's when i shine i think yeah and and when you're if you're going to do a cover or emulate something that you appreciate and you enjoy about somebody else's work it naturally should gravitate towards your interpretation right mm -hmm. i mean if you're going to enjoy playing it so what if you missed a couple of notes in the solo it's it's your interpretation of it and you're enjoying it and you're grooving on it right. so um to me that's like the ultimate form of flattery of somebody else's me like oh yeah you enjoyed it and you're so like i like that part of the solo that you know, I, ne I never played it like that right you know like and then you play this back and forth that yeah. yeah you know if somebody actually hears you do it you know if it's somebody you know Way um funnier <laughs> um so you create music and give it away under creative commons like i do like kevin mcleod yes. does what drew you to that initially kevin like McLeod. what it, it ultimately him yeah he, ultimately he him. drew me to that i didn't even know that okay. was a thing okay how long ago was that? 10 years ago, maybe. Okay. So you'd already established, um, you know, four or five years of putting stuff out there and putting things on a YouTube channel. And you were just getting into the DAW, it sounds like, because that's around the time that you picked up yeah. the so, computer-based stuff, right? I mean, I would say I, I produced music properly maybe for two or three years. Mm -hmm. I actually knew, like, I still have those pieces out there because they're they're good enough. Mm -hmm. um, right. <laughs> and then I did what everyone did, like, how do I get my music on Spotify? How do I get, like, famous? How do I get a million plays on this song? Right. It turns right. out that's very close to impossible. <laughs> so uh, I, I quit my job um, to work for a local theater uh, making music for their shows and okay. like I already had a mortgage I had a down payment on my car I had like yeah so I was uh, financially bound to making money somehow right but then the theater gig just went south because it like bad very bad conditions okay so i just sent out hundreds of emails to names i've seen online and yeah kevin responded and um invited me to like this composer hangout we had back in the day mm -hmm. with uh, rafael from 
the UK. Um, and we started talking and he said the whole thing about free music and I mean it made a lot more sense because I was I was never eager to be one of the like marketing myself and like doing events and like getting myself out there I, I just wanted to like sit indoors and make music yeah and uh yeah, you can't combine that with becoming like a number one uh, hit kind of dudes. <laughs> it, those those people, they've got a giant marketing team behind them yeah. and millions of dollars. Yeah. You know, I, I, I use this one. When I first moved to Florida about 10 years ago, Miley Cyrus had like a single coming out and it was blasted on billboards all over the Tampa Bay area, yeah. right? Like to a level, Alex, that I was like, there are millions of dollars going into this campaign. I, there's no way that she is not gonna, that this single isn't gonna go triple platinum or whatever right. is the 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 line now, yeah. you know what I mean? Because yeah. without physical, but there's still physical media, but it's not emphasized like it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I'm still trying to understand what those benchmarks are for people nowadays because I, I just don't know how relevant they are anymore. It's just, it's it's crazy. It's I don't know how a traditional musician makes the kind of money that they make I, without they're, endorsements they're or without touring, yeah. you know? There's some sort of they're a product. product. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's more than just music. And I see that, especially in Norway, like we have probably hundreds of reality tv shows and mm -hmm. they basically just invite celebrities to compete in different things it's like the masked singer like you have in the u.s yeah like a bunch yeah. of famous people behind a mask and i think most celebrities and musicians actually make a living from like tv exposure these days yeah and less from what they're actually known for but then, of course, you have the like, like Taylor Swift and Rihanna and those people who will sell out stadiums no matter where yeah. they go. And of course, they will always make good money on that. But it blows me away yeah. that, like, the arena people, right? I, I think back to like, and I'm sure you can appreciate and resonate with this. Like, I think back to the big hair bands of like the '80s and the metal bands and the new metal that came out of the '90s. Some of these bands would fill like football stadiums. That's insane. Yeah, and it would be a multi-band event. You know, several bands one day, like a Lollapalooza type of thing or whatever. Like, but but like, you know that. And then you see you see this peak and valley with some of these folks, and how then they go back to playing these these smaller venues, and you're just like, how how does that happen? How does how does that like, like, did you run out of things to say, right? Like, did did you like, what does that you know? Because there's some bands like the Rolling Stones. They they have been a 40, 50 year band, right? That's just had a following that that doesn't go away, right? They, there's just this huge following. They have this huge venue for the whole time of their career. Yeah. yeah. Then you got some of these hair bands that they're they're just grateful that anybody's still showing up yeah right it just it's bizarre to me how strange how that how that works right it, it, what does that mean does that mean their message was only temporarily relevant and they didn't grow at the time like what what happened i i i think it's like a marketing issue again yeah like the rolling stones are their music gonna, is gonna live way longer than they are mm -hmm. but I think the like they did something in in the transition to the internet and stuff like that that kind of kept them alive. I don't think everyone did that. Like if it, it kind of feels like bands are dying. <laughs> like there are very <laughs> few new like big bands. What what's the latest metal band that you're that you're excited about? That's like newer metal. 
I mean, there are bands like uh, like Lorna Shore, uh, like Slaughter to Prevail, all these like deathcore bands that are okay. doing well, but they're not going to last forever, I think. Um, just because like their 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 target group are young people who will get tired of stuff eventually. Right. Like everyone's right. just scrolling to the next video and like finding new interests, finding new uh, communities to hang out in, and uh, like the stuff is changing really fast. Yeah, I find that there were there's a core group of metal that resonated with me, like in the '80s that drew into the '90s, and. And those bands like System of a Down, Corn, um, uh, Lamb of God, you know, like those bands resonated with me and they still resonate with me to this day. But then there's some of this new metal that's come out. And I want to, to some degree, some of them, I could listen to six of them in a row. And they all have very similar qualities. And I don't feel like they're telling me a new story. Right. Which I'm not judging their art or their ability to perform. I'm sure they're an awesome show and the music is good. You know, I just I think what I resonate with and what what makes me excited about music and about creating about the art of creating music is hearing something I've never heard before or hearing a combo of things that I've heard before in a different way that I'm like, oh, wow, I've never heard somebody do this. Mm -hmm. This is exciting to me. I want to hear more of that. Yeah, I don't hear that as much anymore. And I know partially why. I think a lot of people that are doing things the traditional way, they're afraid to take a chance or take a risk because, listen, you're putting all this time, energy, and, and devotion into something you you need a payday this is this you're all in with this you don't have some side gig that's paying you the paying the bills or mm -hmm. whatever so they have to do something that's safe same thing happens with the movie industry that's why we have these cookie cutter movies from hollywood and you know 10 20 movies a year are what resonate with the audience because they're safe yeah. you know nobody's taken big chances or anything you know with with a few rare exceptions right yeah um, I mean, you you can see what happens to bands that take chances, like mm. uh, like when Metallica released uh, Saint Anger, mm. and like the entire fan base just hated it. Yeah, because this is not Metallica for me. This is not right. how it should sound. Well, the Black Album did that for some people. Because yeah, I know. They I know. They went from it just, and I can honestly say, to a very um, a mild degree, I was one of those people because I was a huge Injustice for All fan, and then the Black Album went to some more traditional standard rock roots, yeah. and it exploded their fan base yeah. because now it resonated with people that weren't into speed metal, right? right? And and they started selling out. You know amphitheaters and stuff yeah. uh I mean, and they, they it just was grew their fan base a lot of people hated yeah. it but it still grew yeah but i also didn't like the really early stuff either you know i i didn't i didn't really like kill them all like i just I, that, that was very raw yeah and um not as well produced in my in my mind's eye or whatever and somebody could be like the hell with you <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah, all pissed think, off like, you know i didn't like kill them all at first either but yeah then i became a metallica fan and then i like kill them all yeah for some reason yeah. well but, you listen to were you were you a core or are you a corn fan do you like that um i'm not yes no. no no not really not really okay their early stuff um that their their uh title release you know um I think it's got a kid with a on a swing set or something on the on the cover of it. Mm -hmm. That was super raw and super different, and that super resonated with me. Yeah. But then you go about four or five albums in, and I've I've seen them perform multiple times. I saw them like 
probably six times in my lifetime. And I saw them with their first album release and them being an opening band and the crowd just going nuts. Like they opened for a Danzig show, right? And <laughs> <laughs> it was it was Corn, Marilyn Manson, and Danzig. Jesus. And this, this this was in New Britain, Connecticut, in this like hole in the wall place. Um, uh, well, it was called the Sting. I don't even think it exists anymore. But it was a standing room only club, right? Where you literally like the first come first serve. You get close to the stage and you stand there. You're gonna bruise your entire waist because yeah. <laughs> you're getting pushed into that stage. Yeah. Um, but uh, they between them and Marilyn Manson were amazing at that show. Danzig was like. Not that I don't dislike dancing, but it was like, uh, I don't know. It was like, a, a, it, it they didn't seem to mesh. I was like, why are you opening these two yeah. other two bands opening? They're, they're monsters right now. And then Danzig is the headliner. And it was kind of like, I don't know, anticlimactic when he came on stage, you know? Yeah. But I mean, I, the whole room was jumping to corn and, and like, it just, there was so much energy. And then, you know, fast forward to a show I saw like six albums in and everything got very, very corporate, you know, now there's a lot of money behind him and everything. And the music changed. And then, then I started like getting away from them because of like, cause like that original feeling, that original sound, yeah. which is so cool. It was just like, wow, there's something, you got something going on here. What is this? You know? But I think, I mean, People change as well, so it's true. I mean, I still like listening to things that I listened to when I was fourteen, but I think I like listening to it now because I resonate with the feeling I had when I was fourteen. Right. I would never pick up that band today, but uh, I mean, it, it's very clear that today bands that you like get far there usually it's like one of their members get famous on youtube and then people start listening to their band it's like people don't discover bands the same way anymore like we used to back in the day it's like picking up a cd from the local cd shop and uh, listening to it and right it. so i mean all these like the sound has changed completely so everyone now can get a good sounding record out like, yeah right from their own house exactly you know so back in the like, day that that cost you like investments to actually get a good sounding song out there yeah thousands of dollars an album exactly, easily yeah easily so i mean that's just not the way it works anymore and i mean that's kind of good because you uh can find very very talented people just by browsing the internet but at the same time there's there are so many mm. it's like an overflow and it's like hard picking one of them to stay loyal to like right you don't do that anymore but it's like most of them most of them have that that um which we'll call that paywall mm -hmm. for you to get Either that or it's it's on a streaming platform like Spotify or something yeah. like that. Um, but if you want if you want a full experience with some of these folks, there's a paywall associated with it. Um, how how is giving it away for you? How has that affected your catalog and and your note like like you being known? You know, and what are some of the crazy things that happened to you by simply giving it? Like, what are some things you're like, my God, I can't believe that this is happening with me and I'm giving it away. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, uh, it's a tough question because I don't really know, but the, the thing you don't have to worry about when you give it away for free is marketing yourself. Mm. Like the same way you would, because people do that for you. Like that's their payments, right? Including your name. And, yeah. Cause uh, whenever they use it, they're giving you attribution. And if they are consistently using your catalog, then every time they post a video or every time they do a meme or every time they do a yeah. TikTok, your name is flowing through that process. Yeah. Right. And I mean, that's just how the internet works. It seems like is the more mentions your name has, the more gigs you're going to get. Yeah. Uh, it's just like 
the algorithm on all these different platforms are just so different that once you start publishing things on the internet one platform might go super well and the, the other one is nothing even though this that platform might might have the same people on it right just like this platform decides to push you forward and this one doesn't that's why i think it's it very important for people to be on as many platforms as they they can handle yeah yeah i mean the challenge there right is people try to game the system so people figure out what the algorithm is and then they start pivoting their content to maximize the effect of their content through the algorithm mm -hmm. and then the various platforms realize like okay this isn't ultimately getting our audience the value that we want them to have so now we're going to twist the algorithm to a way that we get quality content and not just a volume of content yeah for people because people are getting frustrated with what's getting flown through to their feed right and the issue with that is that you constantly have to pivot to provide the service that you want to provide right like yeah. we want to we as creative commons composers want to get it into as many people's hands as possible and the challenge is it's like you just i just want to focus on writing and not all this administrative, but like the administration changes. Like yeah. you just, you look away for 10 minutes and you're like, oh shit, what, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Annoying. But I mean, if that's your yeah. gig, then good for you. If you're uh, like good at understanding how stuff works on the internet, that's, that's good for you. I mean, if you make a video about punching a barrel with a knife, that, mm. that's your content. Uh, if you're really good at the internet, <laughs> you can make that work. Right. It's like some people are just very good at things. Some people are yeah. good at making money. I mean, no, they do it in a bunch of different ways. I, I, I would never even occur to me to do it. But I mean, people, people are extremely talented. And uh, if that gets you... If that pays your bills, then then good for you. I mean, yeah. Even though I think your content is absolutely terrible, and there are very <laughs> there, there's absolutely no work behind it. If you make it work, then kudos. I mean, yeah. that's respect for for doing that. Yeah, I've always felt like when creating content or deciding what content to put out, one of the barriers for me has always been this weird inner dialogue of, okay, I'm making this video and am I, am I being inauthentic? You know, am I, am I just trying to, you know, ride a wave or am I just, you know, am I just trying to gain the system myself? And ultimately I'm trying to, I'm trying to entertain an audience while still providing the music mm -hmm. and kind of wrap the whole thing around some entertainment thing. And I probably should just, not worry about any of that yeah. inner dialogue and just if it's if it's fun just do it yeah right just just do it for the sake of doing it because you like it and it's fun yeah uh, a, a particular example of that was um i stumbled down that rabbit hole of back rooms on youtube and it's i don't if you're not familiar with the the subgenre it's like images of like empty luminal spaces like that that kind of stuff like where it's like basements or like rooms that have nothing in it or barely anything in it like minimal stuff low lighting all that yep. and it was around halloween this past year and i'm like oh i've always liked this concept and i had written this tune that lended itself to image changes because of the way that the the drops happened in the song mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm going to go into mid journey and I'm going to generate like 30 images and like drop into those images and like create this video. And I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun making it yep. and I thought it was cool and mysterious and creepy and eerie yep. and kind of celebrated like this, my horror genre, which I'm very, you know, very much is what I gravitate yeah, towards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it resonated a little bit with my audience, but I'm like, 
first of all, I don't have a huge following on YouTube anyway, but I'm like, I like doing that. I have fun doing that. You know, I, I think in that will have an effect on your viewership as well, because it's like, yeah. sometimes it feels almost as if your audience can feel that you had fun doing it. Yeah. And they respect that. And they like the, like it, they like, this being authentic but it, now what do you yeah what are your favorite genres like what 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 oh, do you usually metal, write in metal easy yeah. yeah but i mean that's not i i would say the main genre for me to compose in for like my my business and my followers uh that's mm. either like fantasy music like medieval celtic stuff like that I yeah mean, I, those eras are not fantasy but they they go hand in hand they lend themselves reason. to it yeah 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 and um that's like 80 percent of my audience and then 20 percent of my audience are there exclusively for the for the metal stuff and then you have combo you have celtic oh, yeah. that has oh, the yeah. metal stuff in it which i love yeah, that's, that's <laughs> shit what? I, I, that, it's rare when sometimes that just comes to me and but it's when you sit down in the studio that's one of the hardest genres for me to compose if i'm not like in the mood for it oh really yeah i can't force that that just like happens maybe twice a year no kidding yeah it's weird <laughs> yeah i fall into these patterns where i i either have not enough running ideas or too many mm -hmm. and when I, I almost feel like too many creates this this higher level of indecision because it's like okay there's 15 ideas in say like lo-fi i've got going right now um and my typical minimum for an album is eight songs okay. so i'm like there's plenty there i could i could take eight of those and finish them up and master them and finish it this week blah blah but then but if there's too many decisions to make like that's that's why i, I wrote this three-year thing where i'm like okay i've got these genres yeah. i want to work on and so many iterations of it and then i'll just i'll schedule it out like on a micro level yeah. on a monthly basis weekly basis that kind of thing yeah um do you have a specific way that you that you generate ideas or do you just go with the flow and just sit down consistently they and usually right. like if i try to force it nothing comes out ever mm. that's that's the worst thing but i usually every single time i go to bed um something just pops up in my head and if i'm smart i whistle that melody into my recording app on the phone okay and then i produce <laughs> it the day after uh sometimes i think like oh my god this melody is so good i'm definitely gonna remember this in the morning but and, and then never do yeah it's, right it's gone i was just gonna you, you started off you're like like often when i go to bed i get this thing on my head and then my brain immediately went as you were talking like and then you don't go to bed because <laughs> <laughs> because it would drive me freaking nuts I to know. have this idea it's like, and i'm like I, no I'm having I a really hard time getting getting out of bed if i first go to bed so I have to do the whistle thing. And sometimes I release that raw whistle audio to my patrons. Like, here's where the idea came from. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> oh, that's a that. great idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so bad. It's like, I have to be quiet because my wife is sleeping next to me. So if like, I'm suddenly in bed whistling a melody, she's going to kick me in the ass. But <laughs> I have these bad recordings on my phone. But I was going to say about the thing you said about too many ideas. I feel yeah. the exact same way because right now I have probably 15 uh, projects on my, my in my studio where it's just like eight bars of fucking awesome songs. It's like right. the best melody I've ever written. I, I can't get past the eight bars. It's just like I, I record this thing I have in my head and then I just get demoralized thinking that oh, I'll have to make a whole song out of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I found um, 
regularly going back and taking a time, taking time to listen to things that I've dropped into logic, like one day a week, just going back and reviewing it and like deciding if I'm going to jump into something and work on it or yeah. not. I've had stuff, some of my favorite stuff I've written has sat on my drive for like six months to a year. I've come back to it and I didn't know how to continue it on from that initial idea. Yep. And then when I developed it from there beyond when it was time, I was like, holy shit, this yeah. is, where did this come from? <laughs> and weird, it, it wasn't there a year ago. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the thing I want, I, I try to do with everything I create as much as possible. Like some stuff is just, is really, um, it really is just functional. You know, like I know people need X. Yeah. So I'm creating X. Yeah. And is it enjoyable? Sure. Is it my favorite style? No. But it does the work. It does the thing. Yeah. And again, you never know what people are going to like, man. You know, you just, your job is to make. Yeah. And make, produce, get out there. And, it, and also, that's one of the things I find the most rewarding as well is seeing something I made have a success. Mm. So if I post like that's how I got into the whole Celtic stuff. I, I made something that like it came straight from the heart. I had no inspiration. It was just like a bunch of harp and like big string sections and stuff like that. Right. And suddenly that song just blew up on the internet. And at that point, I think I made a album for like with similar songs and two or three days <laughs> like the feeling I, feeling i got when people just commented like this is amazing like it just gave me so much motivation to continue doing that so i i kind of thrive on people's approval <laughs> i don't know <laughs> childhood trauma i don't know something yeah. like that well, I, I guess well I, how else are we supposed like in this era how else are we supposed to resonate with our audience without having at least a small, like a finger on the pulse of what resonates with them? Yeah, I have no idea. And then, it, it, you know, I mean, I that absolutely makes sense to me. Yeah. And and I get it. I get a charge out of regularly going out and doing YouTube searches on, you know, people using my music and seeing the way that they've added visuals to. The music that I had and oftentimes they'll take something I did for like a horror album or even like like a glitch or like a like an electronic album yep. and they'll use it in a way I never thought somebody would use the music that's cool and I'll watch it and I'm like oh this is an interesting way of juxtaposing my music against yeah. visuals you know and man the responses you get from people from just it's... like having gratitude for using the music Hardcore. that to me is probably one of the best dopamine hits yeah. you can get yeah, that's, for doing what that's we do. the best payment yeah like seeing the appreciation yeah. in people hey money's nice too but <laughs> it's important but, but I, I think this is why you're gonna succeed in the music industry way faster than well, i do is because like you you have this interest in understanding how the world works and you do like proper research, you're scheduled, you have like a, like a three year schedule. I don't even have a two day schedule. You know, I like, I, I, I just can't do it. I'm, I'm the most unstructured moron in the world. Well, you're very generous, Alex, <laughs> but it's, it's an idea, right? It's an idea on my wall that, may become the bane of my existence yep. or it may be the motivation yeah you know or both but depending upon the day something. <laughs> and that's well, I, uh, I i just I, like i i this is have this have been my thing was which is probably why it's taken me so long to get to the point i am uh today it's just like formalities and like corporate bullshit like all the, the all the the business part of becoming a mm. musician, I just find it so boring. 
like i just want to make music that's all i want to do or at <laughs> least it's been for the past 10 years yeah so like understanding how the internet works no interest whatsoever yeah i just want to divide my games into 50 percent playing video games 50 percent making music <laughs> that's all i want to do the rest i want to sleep eat and shit that's it <laughs> that sounds awesome <laughs> i i had to like for years i had to pivot and do the other kind of work for my livelihood you know so so my art was always secondary and it really started to ramp up in the 2000s i started to do a bunch of independent films with my best friend tom seymour and it really started ramping up around 2010 when we shot a feature length narrative mm -hmm. called mark of the beast and um i was executive producer on it and you know, I had done a couple of scores for movies with him. And then we got into this whole documentary series about, um, uh, what's, what is it? Uh, physical media, like, um, independent film or, or cult films and the decline of physical media and all that stuff I had, I did on the side while I had like a normal, yeah, I would say normal, but like a, a traditional, you know, corporate day to day yeah. job, yeah. you know, earning all the money I need yeah. to be able to fund the stuff I want to do, exactly. you know, and all my equipment and, yep. you know, all the software synthesizers and stuff like that. Now it's like, uh, ever since I started publishing, it's, it's an addiction. I don't have any problem admitting to having, and I don't ever want to give it up. Same. It's just like, I want to go, 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 go. Like, you know, I, I hit a wall fourth quarter last year where I really struggled to breach 500 and I had to sit down with myself a couple times Alex and be like what's my problem what is going like I've been I, I was at like just under 300 June Jeez, and then I right and then I and then I went to 480 six I think it was in like October what? And then I, who are you? I, <laughs> and then I couldn't move. I couldn't move. And it was like, I was sabotaging myself from breaking that. Like, what are you afraid of? Break 500. Let's go. Yeah. You know? And it's, it was weird. It was, it was really weird. Cause I know like Alex, I had, I had a bunch of stuff I hadn't finished yet. There's no reason I couldn't just sit down and just like groove on it and figure it out and get it out there. Like yeah. good enough, good enough, good enough. Boom. Get it out there. Let people use it. Um, that it's weird. That is the best example I've heard of a creative burnout. <laughs> <laughs> Cause that was a lot that, in a very short period of time. You that, know, my friend is a creative burnout. <laughs> Yeah, I know that's a psychologist, but that's what it is, hundred percent. So, the way I got through it was in December. I said, "Okay, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to get through two more compilations of of songs, breach that 500 mark, and then I don't have to publish anything until after the middle of the next of." Uh, the next month and the first of the year you know what i mean and uh and once i established that line in the sand it was like smooth sail i was like okay i can finish this 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 yeah. there was something psychologically that wouldn't let me breach that number jesus and and now it's done and now i'm now i'm like yeah. okay <laughs> what are we gonna do in 2024 yeah let's do it let's do it that's uh, um that's very impressive <laughs> that is not okay. <laughs> but are there any yeah. styles you dislike? Like, are, are there things that you'll never write in? I don't like making lo-fi. Really? Yeah. I I did it. I made one song and I was kind of happy with it, but uh, I didn't like making it. But what about that? What about the style? Didn't you didn't resonate with you? Like, what didn't you like? It's too laid back. It's not enough like epic melodies and stuff like that. I really okay. like melodies. 
and harm yeah. is. I'm I'm a sucker for it. Well, with a metal background and you gravitating towards that, I imagine a lot of the stuff that you create needs to be at the very least mid level energy, if not high level energy, right? Yeah. 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 It's um like it, it's important to say it's melodic metal. That's my, that's like my jam. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of Finnish bands and bands that like have this whole medieval theme. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of like uh, war sound samples in the beginning of their song before everything just goes to hell. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. For me, the song needs to have either very beautiful melodies or just like a fucking deadly rhythm one of the two <laughs> like i i can i can enjoy both so you must be a big prog rock fan right like are you a big dream theater fan like I, do you like i am actually not but I okay do respect them highly okay. as musicians they're extremely talented but the, it, it just doesn't resonate with me but tool yeah. on the other hand mm -hmm. that is like mm -hmm. uh, that's 10 out of 10 like everything yeah. they have ever made that is actually music and not just like sound samples for 10 minutes. Oh, right. Like they're in between tunes or like, yeah. like on, uh, uh, anima has a couple of, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call them throwaway, but like they're, they're just like album fillers. Ex they're experiences, yeah. right? They're like these, these strange experiences yeah. to it's, be had. It's just like, uh, it's probably a, sick if you're high on acid or stuff like that but for me not that much but it's like we're not advocating that <laughs> it's like your um fair inoculum the latest album yeah they had like uh every other song was just like a three minute intermission with right thing but every song on that album was more than 10 minutes long yeah so, in fact, one of them was written uh, using the number sequence. Uh, uh, Fibonacci. What was it? Yeah, the Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence, right? That's not on that album, I think. Oh, it's on a different one? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think it's either Lateralis or uh, Vicarious on one of the old ones. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. But, uh, like, all the songs that I love on the new album are longer than 10 minutes so mm -hmm. all the like two or three minute songs in yeah quotation mark uh in in between it's just like uh, sure it's fine if that's what you want to do that's fine but i'm not gonna <laughs> favorite these ones but well, it's yeah. almost like it's almost like those those albums are written in a way like i was a big queensrike fan Mm -hmm. back in the day and i particularly resonated with their concept albums because i liked the fact that all the songs wrapped around a central theme and story yeah right and not for everything right like i i couldn't handle 12 bands i was into that did all that but like resonating with one or two bands that like that's their thing yeah that like they tell a full story like even uh uh I think My Chemical Romance, like one of their albums, was a complete concept album, yeah, if I'm not totally. mistaken. Um, and it all resonated around like some central theme or some story. And I just think that's kind of cool because, I mean, every song tells a story, even if it's just sonically. Yeah. But uh, when you inter when you add lyrics and, you know, a, like a real story behind everything, like I, I watched, I, I saw Queensryche live and they decided like extemporaneously at that concert, they're like, you know what? We're playing the whole mind crime album yeah. tonight. Yeah. And boom, the whole thing front to back they played. And it was amazing with all the visuals and, yeah. and just, it was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Like you, you're like having this long sonic experience, yeah. you know, and it's like it's very it's cool. Provoking some feelings in you. At least it does with me. Mm -hmm. That's why I've never understood like why the vocalist is like the front figure of a band. That's never been the thing for me. Like for me, well, Maynard, 
Maynard doesn't like he'll he'll take a lesser position. Yep. Like that's interesting for in uh, a perfect circle. I've seen that that band multiple times, and he'll actually be at the back end of the stage Same. with low lighting. Yeah, because he's like I'm just another instrument. Yeah, exactly. Like I am not who everybody should be gravitating to. I'm not this grandiose thing. I'm just I'm doing a part here. Yeah, you know. I always found found that to be really cool about that guy. I I love him for that. And that's yeah. exactly maybe why I do respect that band so much. Mm -hmm. So I I like I value his instrument at the same level as I value the guitar and the bass and drums. Yeah, yeah. They and just, Danny's drums are just oh, oh my god. You know it's like sixty five <laughs> or something. That's crazy. He's <laughs> so good. He's so good. And he's like doing all this good stuff where he shows up at a school playing this pink drum set and it's like <laughs> for the darkness in that music these guys seem very very nice like nice yeah. people yeah that'd be fun that that'd be a fun group to to that'd be a good bucket list group oh, yeah. band yeah, to meet have them on the show one you know? like, yeah, absolutely ask them some, i mean some questions there are three major you know between a perfect circle, Pussifer, and and uh, Tool, like they're constantly making something, and, and, and like a lot of them, like there's some of the, I mean Maynard's in all of them, yeah. But um, I think some of the other musicians are in. I think the guitarist bands. is at least in two of them. Yeah, I'm not sure. And all that music is a little different. Yeah, but I resonate with all of it. Oh yeah, I just. I just, I just find it very creative and very inspiring. Yeah. What are you most proud of? Like, what, what have you done that's made you the most proud? As it stands, right? I know that's going to change in time, obviously, but as of today, like what twenty twenty four, the most clout. No, no. What, what are you just most proud? It doesn't matter if it didn't. Like, what are you most proud of making? Like, what, do you, what are you most proud of? I would say that is my metal album psychotic okay okay uh that is i'll have to listen to the whole thing yeah that is actually like i can go back to listening to that album and think where was i <laughs> making this why what was my mindset making this um i i would never be able to recreate that all the other stuff i made is recreatable at some level mm -hmm. uh i don't think this is i don't know why it's, it's just like it, it just came to me uh, at a very very good time i think and uh i'm super proud of it and i i like the like semi shitty sound it has because mixing metal is terribly hard <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i just um just enjoyed making it and i enjoy listening to it to this day yeah that's another thing we've had this conversation in other spaces and off camera but that's something that i think a lot of people don't realize i think about me they you'll definitely reiterate this because we've said this to each other before but i'll go back and listen to my own stuff because i enjoyed what i created but I also like to assess where I where I have been, where I am, and where I want to be. And to what you said earlier, I've gone back and listened to some stuff that I've made so far. And I mean, even though it's only been a few years on some of the things, I go back to it and I'm like, oh, I forgot about this song. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where the hell did this come from? Yeah. Like, I don't even like some of the songs I go back to and I'll, I'll hear on YouTube or something and I'll be like, wait, I think that's mine. Yep. <laughs> that happens. I, I go back and I'm like, <laughs> holy shit, that's me. That's right. I did make that. Okay. That's when you know that you've like gotten to a point where you have a body of work that you're like, uh, yeah. oh, I have to be reminded. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, it happens all the time now and uh, it's so weird. It's such a weird feeling. Yeah. But I, I think, like, 
mainly I make music to have something to listen to in the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that was like my ideal world. It's like because I I if I like something, I just play it over and over and over until I'm sick of it, and then I need yeah. something new. So after I listened to Fair Inoculum by Tool in the car for yeah maybe 20 times yeah i was like oh, i need more like this but i mean i can't ask them to make a new one so <laughs> i will have to make something myself that gives me the same feeling so that's that, that's like my motivation to make more stuff it's just i, I need more to listen to and I, I, I yeah. don't think it's weird for a composer to listen to his own music. I think that's like, why would you make something you don't like listening to? Yeah, that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so why isn't James Hetfield blasting and Justice for All in the car? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> Many years of my life, yeah. you know? It's like, it, <laughs> that's my, my best drive ever has been to like that album why doesn't he do it but uh, <laughs> it's hard I, I i don't i don't know why it's like that but i just yeah. I, I enjoy my music that's that's why i made it so let's like rewind 20 years right well that's might be too far but like 15 okay if you had to start over all over again what would you do differently ouch Knowing what you know now. I'll add that I in. I think that <laughs> since... Yeah. Since <laughs> everything I know is self-taught in some way, mm -hmm. I guess I would just want to learn more before I started publishing. Okay. Uh, because when, you, when you're self-taught, the, the learning curve is not very steep. Mm. It's very gradual uphill. Yeah, and it's that one percent rule going on all the time, yeah. right? Like you, you constantly just okay. I didn't get much done in the writing or creative space today, but I learned these new tools. Yeah, right. Or I've touched, I've touched the surface of these new tools. I know what this is going to do for me in six months to a year. Yeah, and and that that pushes you closer to your goal. Exactly. Right. And uh, I guess I would probably quit school sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just stop wasting my time with stupid stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, I I, I don't really regret anything because I, I don't know any options to what I've done. I've, I've just done what I felt like my entire life to some extent, that's, of course. That's incredibly uh, inspiring. Because cool. most people do what they think they should be doing yeah. most of their lives. And, and then they turn 60 years old <laughs> and they're full of this mountain of regret yeah. that's like, oh, fuck, I don't have much time left. Yeah. There's all <laughs> these things I wanted to do. Well, that's why people have midlife crises. You know, people, you know, get divorces. They do this. They do that. Like, they just, they freak out. They're like, oh, my God, I missed something. Yeah. Like, because they're not they weren't living an authentic life for themselves, yeah. right? I think that's um, very important for people to do. And I think, like, you should always take advice from other people, but, I mean, people are from, people are not perfect, and mm -mm. unperfect people give unperf unperfect advice. So right. be careful with the advice you take. I mean... Absolutely. Grain is salt, right? Yeah. Like, it's like... <laughs> Like the best thing you could do is just be respectful, respectful to other people, and do the things you want to do, as far as it's possible. But it's like I always, I like I quit high school because I thought it was boring. Uh, uh, my mom and dad was very supportive, and it's like I mean they they knew I kind of plowed my own path. Uh, and uh, I quit my job to pursue music. They're terrified but supportive. And um, 
so was I. Like, what the what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's very important to just like have faith in yourself and do the things you want to do. Well, I've been inspired since the first song of yours I've ever heard on Film Music IO. Nice. Um, I don't re I don't remember which one it was, but the yeah. first time I heard the first time I heard your stuff, it, it had metal metal guitars. In it. Okay, nice. It absolutely cool. had metal guitars. <laughs> in it. Um, and I'm sure it was sent to me by Kevin. So, uh, or at least he pushed me. To, he's like, "Oh yeah, Alex, you should check out his stuff." His oh yeah, and then I'll go out there. I was that's like cool. going through going through your catalog. Um, and this past year, um, this past year, you've kind of consolidated into, uh, a website that has your whole catalog available called Creator Chords. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and the inspiration behind that? Absolutely. So the, I've always wanted a good website. Mm -hmm. Like I need a hub for like all my projects. Um, but then again, not enough research. I didn't know who to contact. Like all I could do was Google like web developer and see a horrific price on that. <laughs> so that's a no go. Uh, but then I sold my house like 50 meters that way. Like, uh, one C now I live in one A. I sold that house to a Hungarian couple who I became friends with really fast. And he's a full stack developer. Oh, excellent. So um, we started talking about it. And like, I've always been whining about my old website because it was shit. And um, yeah, he just said that, like, let's do this together. Let's split the sales 50 50 and make you a good website and yeah after eight years of wanting a new website i finally have one and i'm super happy about it it's very user friendly it's easy for me to manage and uh yeah i just rebranded the whole thing because like all the things i made when i was 20 years old were they either had hard long names or yeah which is bad branding basically <laughs> just something i thought sounded cool at the time right so i asked chat gpt like can you give me a good title for for my domain and my my royalty free music business and uh, came up with creative chords and i immediately saw the logo in my head because two, mm. two c's like it, it doesn't get any easier so we made that, we made the website, and now we're working on improving it all the time. And I awesome. finally have a guy that knows what he's doing. I know what I want, but I don't know how to do any of it. Yeah. Yeah, that that aspect of the internet is is a misnomer to me, I'll yeah. tell you. It's just <laughs> I I went down the path of uh which we call it uh, computer science and engineering. Well, the first round of college in the nineties. And uh, it was during the era when they were still teaching machine language, Pascal, uh, C++, yeah. that kind of thing. And none of those languages resonated with me. And <laughs> yeah, I just, I saw myself in the future 20, 30 years later with, you know, pulling my hair out in front of a computer terminal with a bunch of code and the matrix spinning around my face. Yep. And I was like, I, this isn't who I am. Right. You know, I, I can't, I can't do this. So for like little projects, like maybe doing something with AI to create like a, um, a, a browser based video game or something like that, that's one thing, but to ever code in that full stack environment, I just, it's just not me. So I've, I've learned through age and time that <laughs> there's things you can do yeah. and then there's things that you outsource yeah. and play to your strengths, you know, yeah. play, play to what you know how to do. Yeah. <laughs> that is, so. That's that goes with me as well. Like all the things I said about 
choosing your own path and that kind of stuff. The, it, it comes with a downside because you're going to explore a bunch of stuff you don't like doing. Yeah. So you're going to visit uh, a lot of different fields and you're going to dislike 95% of them. <laughs> uh, but music was kind of the one thing that stuck with me. Like I, yeah. I enjoyed that and I still do. And uh, I know uh, I I know a lot of things uh, at a mediocre level. I'm not very good at anything. So, <laughs> so like the whole the the world is still very much unexplored. But yeah, just like I'm a junkie for trying new things. And yeah, I, agreed. Same here. <laughs> But I dislike a lot of it. <laughs> and then I stopped doing it. So, Yeah, I, I have to always remind myself that uh, whenever you see somebody online, especially in a similar space as ours, and they're super successful, you're seeing the, the, the sum total mm -hmm. of all the effort prior to that. Yeah. So... The unfair thing that we do to ourselves as people is we make this comparison as to where we are yeah. right now and where this person is currently and their followers, yeah. their income, their popularity, their notoriety. You know what I mean? Their popularity, notoriety. Yeah. And that is completely unfair. You are two different people, mm -hmm. right? And with two different life paths and two different experience sets. Yeah. And I think... Ultimately, knowing what you want and then making those micro decisions and micro advances every day, like that 1%, yeah. is that's that's just effort plus time equals what you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and that's why typically once a year, if not multiple times a year, I'll come back to the catalog. I'll come back to my schedule. I'll come back to what I want. And that'll shift because I'll do crazy things. Like last year, I'll just give you an example, a couple examples. Last year, I was struggling with, okay, how am I going to get this volume written? So I started this this experiment. January, I wrote 12, or I published 12 tunes. February, I published 24. March, I published 48. And then April, I was going to publish 96. And I'm like, oh, shit, I can't do that many in a month. I'm like, I can't do that. So I had to stop that. <laughs> Right. Because I, I gave myself those milestones. Now, now my big writing thing is, OK, uh, Mondays and Fridays, my goal is to hit 15 ideas. I'm not going to I'm not going to master anything. I'm not going to finalize anything. I'm not going to finish anything. It could be a bar mm -hmm. and it's just this idea. and I'm going to drop it and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to do something else. Right. I tend to average about 10 of those yeah. on those days. And. But in a month, that could be anywhere from 80 to 120 ideas. That's, and over the course of a year, that's a lot of ideas. That's a very good, very good structure. And if I throw out half of them, I'll still be publishing anywhere from five to 600 songs. Yeah. Which may not be finished that same year, but they're, they're workable enough ideas yeah. that... I can push them to the next level so that over the next three years, I could have enough of a catalog that I feel like I'm in front of this AI generated music and not behind it <laughs> so that enough people know about our catalogs. You know, that's, that's my big push. Like I want to make sure that yourself, me, I, Kevin's already established in the, in the zeitgeist. I mean, he was here before he's here with, yeah. He'll be here with and beyond yeah, yeah. the AI, you know? Um, and I know I know you and I have talked a little bit about the AI stuff and the fact that people resonate with individuals more than they do a computer. So if, if you create a body of work and people resonate with it, they're going to follow you as a person, as a personality, because they just love, yep. they just love what you do, you know? And um, I think that's a whereas, big part of the future as well, because the the 
the internet has not been been here long enough. Like people can mm -hmm. now talk to their favorite composers. Like you haven't, you haven't been able to do that for a long time. So right. I think that that part of the industry is actually gonna um, coexist with the AI for a long, long time mm. before it takes over completely. Yeah, I feel like we're, our group, the three of us are very accessible people, right? Yeah. Okay. And we, I have, think we will answer you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's part and parcel for what we're doing too, Yeah, is that what we do is that there's a lot of royalty free music out there and people that have created like probably not the same volume, but there's people out there that have produced a few albums worth of mm. on average, a few albums worth of music. Yeah. Uh, but to to be a resource and have a volume that's you know four figures and beyond you know a thousand plus songs mm -hmm. is kind of a rarity you know but not a lot of people the, most people will put up that paywall and be like nope you can't have access to this until you give me my 20 bucks yeah. you know and that shies away 99 percent of the internet because what 16 year old that's building a youtube channel is gonna shell out 20 hours for every song you know it's I mean, literally impossible for a 16 year old to pay for <laughs> stuff on the internet right Right. Yeah, because they don't have. You're right. You're right. They don't have. They don't have credit cards. They don't. Have, they they would need another resource. Yeah. You know. So they're gonna find the easiest path, which and, is. Yeah. And that sixteen year old might be the next PewDiePie. You never know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's that's another thing that I I measure my success based on the approval of my music i know we have talked about this before like <laughs> like approval of your music versus monetary gain like what feels better and like what what how do you measure your success i i, I think that's super inter interesting talking to you about because i feel like we have kind of the same mindset on that oh absolutely yeah. i would much rather see like a handful of my songs resonate to millions of people knowing that, Oh wow. Like people really like these tunes and it resonates with them and they're enjoying them. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate joy. Yeah. I'll figure out the money part yeah. on the other side of it Yeah. or through some other means yeah. or both, you know, right. The bottom line is that, you know, I couldn't have this conversation 20 years ago. I wasn't in a place that I could do that, exactly. you know, but now that I am, I feel wonderful knowing that, hey, there's these creators out there that are using this stuff, and it's so much fun to see how they interpret it and use it. Yeah. And and I get excited when I see, you know, I'll look up and I'll I'll have a video that shows up and my tunes in there, your songs are in there, mm -hmm. Kevin stuffs in there, and I literally give gratitude for all of us. Yeah. I'm like, thank you so much for using all of our stuff, and then. I've never had anybody be negative about that. No. Like, how could you? How could you? Nobody how could you? loses in this. <laughs> no. It's a win-win. I'm so not trying rare. to. Yeah, I'm not trying to take money out of your pocket. I'm literally asking you to just let people know where you got it. Yeah. You know. And uh, do you want to talk about the content idea thing? Because I have some updates on it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, give a little uh, con uh, uh, primer. Yeah or primer for my audience. So my last year was 90% uh, dealing with uh, false copyright claims, uh, people copywriting my music because it's not copyrighted. So, uh, well, on the internet at least. So um, I decided to sign my music up with the label that puts it into Content Idea, which is the automated uh, copyright system that YouTube uses amongst others. And um, I was super scared to do this because most people are expecting, people don't distinguish between royalty free and copyright free mm -hmm. because nothing, nothing is really copyright free. It is illegal to take copyright on something that you haven't made yourself. Right. And ultimately right. I have the project file so I can prove that I made this before you copyrighted it, you know? So I've right. never been scared of it. 
I've never been scared of people trying to steal my music. But the problem is that when someone takes a song that I have made, gives it another title, uh, copyrights it, signs it up for a content idea, then all the people that use my music or use that song in their video will get a copyright claim from this guy's label. And that's because of the way that those sites, they use algorithms yeah. or so, um, song, song search algorithms that hear the similar exactly. song. So it right? basically scans the audio. And if it finds a match, then the system recognizes the title and who owns the copyright of that song right now. But I ended up signing up with a label that uh, was going to protect me from that. And um, this is where I realized how loyal people are. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that once I do this and people start getting claims from, from me <laughs> for a change, everyone's just going to leave. Like they're going to find right. some other royalty free music composer to, to use stuff from. But I have been very active on updating everyone following me on every single platform, like what the process is going to be like. Right. And everyone has been so supportive. It's insane. Oh, that's awesome. Like people are like saying good for you. We'll like, I got the claim on my video. I just saw your latest post. I know it's like a uh, system false thing from the system. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone has like encouraged me to put my music in content idea. People are mm -hmm. like happy for me that it's now protected. And I've made sure that I've explained to them very thoroughly that this is to avoid them from getting copyright claims from other companies that I yeah. can't, I can't even reach them. You know, like these labels are impossible to reach. They're huge. They're like multi-billion dollar businesses that just automatically does a thing. And it's bad for everyone. It's bad for me because it's like someone else is getting uh, money from placing ads on videos that my music is used in and the the creator is losing money because like yeah a, a, nobody wins in this case right right so um yeah i pulled a plug and i saw the statistics and after a couple of days it was fifty thousand active claims coming from my new label mm -hmm. and uh Patreons are covered. I mean, I'm able to solve this myself. I'm able to like lift the claims and and deal with the claims personally, which is good yeah. because I haven't been able to do that before. Uh, I'm able to whitelist channels, and I've asked everyone to like give me a link to your channel so I can put it in the whitelist. And um, and that means anytime they just so my audience knows that means anytime somebody uses your music, it, you're it's automatically yeah. You're, like you're it's automatically your... listed yeah you're like whether what but that's whether you put the text in the video or not like in the past if you had not made that if you've made matter. that mistake if you're in the white okay. list you're you're good so okay. like but I... ideally you you th what we want is we want attribution in the video yeah. in the description correct so okay. the goal here is to like whitelist everyone that's a patreon because they are always super loyal and they like yeah they're super awesome people um mm -hmm. so i have a system for them and i also have a system so that if my name is present in the video description the system scans the description finds my name and it doesn't place a claim uh of course that is, didn't go exactly as planned so okay a lot of people receive claims anyways but we are able to remove those uh and i also got a lot of emails from people saying like hey i used your music back in the day on this video and they usually have a bunch of views like thousands and thousands yeah uh, i'm sorry i didn't credit you i fixed it now can you lift the claim and it turns out like now that people are getting flagged a lot of people are coming to me apologizing for using it under the wrong terms ah uh, so that's very interesting because now i can see like my music is actually used way more than I thought. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and then yeah. people are coming back to me now, apologizing. And of course, like I tell them what to do and how to get the claim 
removed and everything. But 50,000 claims in three days are sent out uh, across tens of thousands of videos, uh, a billion views in total. Holy cow. So it's like, oh my God, I'm so glad I have this dashboard now <laughs> to see all of these crazy numbers. Now that seems like a uh, a number that's administratively impossible for somebody that's trying to be creative to manage. Like, so how are you how are you working through that now? So the thing with this label is that they are very easy to reach, um, and like they take twenty percent of all all the money I make. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for them that I'm having a good time on this platform. So I can just reach out to them and ask questions all day long and they will respond with a smile, I think. <laughs> and um, so it's not very much for me to deal with. Uh, actually, it's uh, like these are just all the videos that are claimed. Okay. So these are the videos that are where my music is uh used without attribution right <laughs> because, right like the attributed videos don't get claims and this is all on youtube all on youtube right okay so um it's very nice having a having a system to protect you from that uh i have to say even though the transition into the system was kind of was a bumpy ride uh yeah a lot of false claims were sent out and a lot of, I've been responding to probably 30 emails every single day and um, but I like it's always been very important for me to to respond to people fast make them happy uh, do what I can to to make them feel safe to use it because I mean that's what we're here for right right uh, but um no, I, I'm I'm very surprised on how loyal people are, and it made me made me less scared about the AI <laughs> to see that <laughs> because like well, it's encouraging. It, people can it, just drop out anytime. For but sure, they don't. and and the internet's fickle, right? right? The internet's very fickle. Yeah, and not to I'm not pissing on our audience here at all in in that statement, but. Yeah. You know, when, when you're trying to create content and you and you hit a wall and something's giving you pushback, uh, you're going to take the path of least resistance, especially if you're trying to get out a body of work or mm -hmm. body of content as fast as possible. Yeah. Right. You're just I'll just I'll just pick something else. OK, boom. Yeah. Right. Um, knowing that your catalog is protected and safe and somebody else isn't out there trying to trying to claim mm -hmm. rights to it or whatever. Um, that's the thing that sucks. We give it away. Yeah. We give it away. It's... And then somebody, some jerk out there takes advantage of the fact that we're doing that and tries to claim it as theirs. Yeah. I couldn't, I would never feel good about myself doing that. But I guess that just, that's just how speaks to are... who I am as a person. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people are still calling old people to empty out their credit card and like scam is still a thing. Yeah. And uh, that's just the way it is. And, if you live in a world eating ramen out of the toilet, then you would probably do the same thing. This is true. But yeah, this it, is it, true. It feels it feels very good. It feels very good to have uh, a system that I can work with because I'm happy to work. I'm happy to work. Yeah. I like I can do a lot of administrative stuff. That's that's fine. But once it gets out of your control, that's when you get problems. Yeah, and specifically to some of these platforms where somebody else brought your material there, claiming it as theirs, yeah. and now they're pretty much this hands-off site that has algorithms that determine who can post their their creative works and not. Yeah. And you know, you don't really have a body per se that's that's Nothing. checking on anything. You know, I had the same problem with an advertising company that I used to promote some of my songs on Spotify, mm -hmm. you know, but guaranteed to be organic, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, this is whatever. 
And then all of a sudden Spotify starts like hammering me through DistroKid about some some bots are like that we've detected blah 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 you know really? well the company the company i was subscribed to must have changed their protocol at some point throughout the summer because i didn't start getting the hits hmm. until like september september october and then i righted the situation i immediately stopped the relationship i stopped the promotions you know the second i found out about it I actually had to unpublish three albums. Jesus Christ, really? And then, and then republish them because they were pointing to the URLs of the individual songs in the promotions. So they said the best thing you can do is unpublish and republish this. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, great. So now I got to do that. So I do all that. And then they go through another royalty review and they give me a second strike. I'm like, fuck. And I'm, like, I'm like, I did what you asked, you know? And there's nobody to call. There's nobody like all these, all these places are automatic. Even spot like, if I had to, I'm sure I could find a number of corporate for Spotify or whatever yes. and but get to difficult. the bottom. But I, yeah, but how am I gonna like all that stuff's automated? Yeah. At this point, I think this year, there's like literally like hundreds of thousands of songs published to Spotify a day. Yeah, you know, through various things. It's whether very it's very easy, very easy. Yeah, Bandcamp or DistroKid yeah. or um tune core like any of those self-publishing yeah. avenues like people that's it you know yeah. um so now it's like 2024 is this big thing i'm like okay i'm getting back to the roots advertising roots and going okay the various platforms what's the best way to get the music into the hands of the people i know need it mm -hmm. i.e you know content creators little budget no budget kind of thing that's that's who i want to use it i want i that's that's my core audience yeah. you know it's not it's not a blockbuster movie from hollywood that's not my audience you know not at all it's it's the little guys it's the little guys that want to that are trying to get their feet wet yeah. and you know make their mark in the world yeah. and uh and because... yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah but it's also very funny though, because like particularly this this copyright issue where I've spent probably I would say it's probably two or three years since I got my first like false copyright claim from someone stealing. Yeah. And I have been communicating this to people casually when they've asked me. Every single time I got an email like uh, I got a claim on a video and I have to explain that this isn't coming from me. But after two or three years of doing that, everyone just knows. Mm. It's like I, I've i tried to explain this to people for so many years. And now just everyone knows. I mean, I didn't right. tell everybody. But it's just like, how, how does this spread? Like, how, how does this message spread to everyone? And the, the the emails just change. Like I get, I probably have to respond with the exact same words to 30 emails every day. Right, right. The, the request is changing. So the way I respond today to 30 people might not be the same way I respond to 30 people tomorrow. Right. So it's weird how people just kind of get it. <laughs> yeah. It's almost that collective consciousness shift, yeah. right? Like you've you've changed your methodology as to how the music is registered. And now instead of people coming at you claiming a problem that they assume or associate with you directly, now they understand that oh, I missed a point I missed a like a pro part of the process in my creative process of uploading a video yep. and it's on me. So now the ownership has been, is, is back to the source, yeah. which is the person creating the video. Yeah. Cause ultimately that's, that's basically what we're trying to convey here with the situation that the path that you've chosen to take here yeah. with the content ID, which is, Hey, it, nothing's changed. It's, you can still use my stuff for free with attribution. Uh, but that's the key is yep. that, You've got to give attribution in the video or you're going to get flagged. Yep. Or if you're a Patreon 
you're whitelisted. And that's it. And then Super now people understand, hey, okay, I never put his name. Yeah. Or a reference to where the, I got the song in the video. I amend that situation. It's fixed. The ID goes away, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know? Or like, the... Ideally, I, I don't want to be this harsh. <clears throat> like, I actually don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't given a shit about this for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, if people credit yeah, me or there's, not. There's, it's like... there's money on the table yeah, for all of us, it, right? Exactly. So, like, yeah. if I lose like a uh, video with a million views then okay that sucks but i was still featured in the video with a million views right though i'm the only one who, know who knows but right it's still kind of a cool thing but i i didn't do this to like punish the people who didn't credit me in the video i did this right. because like the workflow just came became too much for me to deal with all the false claims so right so i i i pulled the plug on it and now i have to like seem like this harsh strict <laughs> royal free music composer who actually gives a shit but well the yeah. I ideally what's going to happen is you're going to have you're going to have a dust settling period right mm -hmm. and let's 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 make a guess um if i had to venture a guess based on how long you've been writing music and how long you've been uh, releasing it and publishing it and making it available online, we're probably looking at a one to three month period where you're going to get these strikes and a, a series of emails, right? Yeah. And then come April or so, a lot of this is going to fall off That's what because, too. because people are going to be in line with what their process is and what procedures need to be had. Yeah. And then you're gonna you're you're gonna live in a world of three different things, right? You're gonna you're gonna be living in a world of uh, new content creators that don't know all the details of the process that they need to approach, even though they've taken a piece of music from a site that explicitly <laughs> shows them what they're supposed to do, yeah. right? Um, you've got long-standing people that finally the algorithm is found. And is dealing with that. Yeah. Or the third thing, which is <clears throat> it's gonna identify somebody legitimately trying to steal your stuff. Yeah. Right? And it's gonna eliminate that a hundred percent because that's the whole purpose behind this. And it it'll just you can't do that. Like it's it's registered. Yeah. So So yeah. nothing bad comes out of it for me personally. Right. Like, I avoid people using it under the wrong terms. And, I mean, that's fine. It's never been the goal to, like, punish those people at all. But as a part of the whole world as it's now, then it's just a necessary step for me to take. And we'll see how it goes. But I think you're right. I think yeah. you're right. That's that's the, three, the upcoming three or four months is going to be a lot yeah. of uh, emails. But yeah, that's fine. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the resolution for you. And it obviously is going to set a precedent for not only myself, but anybody else that we get, we encourage I'll going be, forward. I'll be the test, test subject. <laughs> if it works out, I'll let you know. If it doesn't, I'll also let you know. <laughs> well, we're here to help you if, <laughs> in any way, shape or form, Alex. <laughs> Well, it's been great catching up with you, Alex. Um, like I just I, I I appreciate you uh, being on Tim Cool Free Music Podcast today, and uh, I I uh, I hope uh, I hope this solves all of your administrative woes, and uh, we'll I look I look forward to our healthy competition going forward here with our music production and I've onward already, and upward. I've, I've already lost, so but I, I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm fine with it. <laughs> I, I I think I think you're throwing in a towel way too early. I think we'll, we'll I think see. We'll see. <laughs>